So hello, everyone. Uh, we have a very special time uh, together tonight with the Reverend Dr. Cedric Bridgeforth, a friend of mine for now 20 years, over 20 years, actually, since about the year 2000 when I ended up in California. Um, Cedric is quite an incredible and wonderful human being, and we are so privileged to be able to hear from him tonight um, and his courageous telling of his own story. Uh, he has quite a long and impressive resume. Some of the things that are, are highlights for me uh, is being uh, the president of the Black Methodist for Church Renewal uh, for the country for a season. Um, being really active in the leadership of the California Pacific Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church uh, for quite a while, including being my district superintendent for a bit. Um, but he's had more roles um, in that leadership than I can uh, list off the top of my head at this moment. Um, but he continues to be in leadership there right now as conference communications uh, person. I think that's not the official title. It is an innovation and communications kind of uh, job that's crafted for his unique and beautiful creative skill set. Um, so he has written a fantastic book called Alabama Grandson, A Black Gay Minister's Passage Out of Hiding. It looks like this. And if you don't have this book, I highly encourage you to get it. Tell your friends um, to, to go and to grab this book. It is a fantastic read. You will not want to put it down. You'd be like, and what happened next? So, um, if you uh, don't have it, please, he's choking up. If you don't have it, please do, uh, consider getting it. It will not only tell you a little bit about Cedric's life, but it will open your eyes to some of the things, um, that, uh, people who are, uh, part of our churches who are gay or who are African-American um, have to go through and, and process and um, live out in different ways um, that's probably different than what you thought. And so here we are having some of that discussion tonight so that we all can learn and grow from our better understanding. Um, so let's start with this, Cedric. Um, you know, this, this book is really, really very candid. It's very vulnerable. It's really brave. Um, so I would love for you to tell us about what motivated you to share so deeply about your own experience. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Anna. And first, let me uh, give thanks to all of you for joining. Thanks to you, Anna, and um, for those who put this event together. And I was sharing with Anna before you all came on, this is like my first public thing uh, since the launch. So, uh, so this is exciting uh, to be in this, uh, in this space. Um, one of the things that um, when we planned this and Anna shared this first question with me, uh, one, one thing that was true, one thing that was not true that is true now, is that one of the individuals who was on the editorial team who really um, asked some deep and probing questions and really pointed out some places where I maybe had not been um, as forthcoming as I needed to be for the story to make sense, um, you know, places where I just sort of glossed over some detail, um, the editor's name was Ruth, and um, we just got word yesterday that Ruth was was killed in an accident on Tuesday, and um, and so Ruth was an integral part of this project and always will be. There's no way now for me to tell the story of Alabama grandson without remembering her and what uh, she and the others on the team. Um, pulled out of me in order to ensure that this story was told and told well. So what led me to, to write this was, um, you know, just, I, I was just in a place where I was just feeling reflective. I'd gone through um, what I believe was a horrible time in life and in ministry and felt like I was starting to get my, my legs under me again and, and was really just in a place of like, you know, what was all this about and what, what have I learned? And as I started reflecting on that, it was like, you know, but 
what's my life been about? And what do I want my life to be about? How do I want to live my life going forward? And one, one thing that was very clear to me was that I wanted to live, I want to live my life. I choose to live my life in a way that um, I tell my own story. I acknowledge my own truth and I walk in it while encouraging and hopefully inspiring and challenging others to do the same. And um, in, in thinking about that, I started uh, just sort of tracking life lessons that I've uh, learned over time and quickly realized that much of what I claim to have learned in adulthood was really seeded very early in my life, uh, and primarily through the example and um, witness of my grandmother. And so this started as a series of letters just to her. And, um, and evolved into what we all have before us now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it seems that you have had um, a lot of different influences, family influences in your life. Um, some of those were, were very positive, but other ones were not. Um, can you talk about some of the lessons um, that you learned not just from your grandmother, but also I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the relationship and struggles uh, you talk about in the book as well with your father. Mm, mm. Yeah, I have a, a pet name for him that I, um, let's see, there are too many church people on here for me to use that, that term. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you all can DM me and I'll, I'll give you that language some, some other time in a, in a different context. But you know, the real thing here, um, Anna, is that I know for a fact sitting here today that it is impossible to love pieces and parts of people. You mm -hmm. have to love people in whole or not at all. There's no such thing as partial love, right? Mm -hmm. And so even with those who were not always encouraging, those who were not present, um, for my own health, for my own well-being, for my own sense of, of self and, um, and, and, and being able to live out my own purpose in life with any amount of integrity, I've had to make choices, right, about how I will love, forgive, how I'll extend grace and mercy, and how I will not, right? Mm. And so, um, so I, of course, you know, this is all shaped around my relationship and uh, with my, with my grandmother, but, you know, my mom, uh, very instrumental in, in my life and, and um, one of the best human beings ever. <laughs> um, ooh, that hit me right there, but <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But I am certain that for all the good that my grandmother, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, um, you know, cousins, friends, people in the neighborhood, of all the good that they did, if it were not for my mom loving me as she did, um, using the tools that she had, doing the best she could with what she had, I would not be sitting here today. So I want to be very clear about that. Um, you know, but there's, you know, my, my godmother, Betty Gill, uh, who uh, just stepped in, filled in the gap and, um, <laughs> and continues to love me uh, to the depths of my soul to this day. And that whole family, uh, you know, is a part of the circle of folks who have just always been around and always been around me. And I, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. And I think because of that, uh, as I moved out into the world, I have um, sought out uh, community, supportive community. I sought uh, spaces where I could be a part of things that were bigger than just myself or my own voice. And have tried to do my absolute best to um, to show up in those spaces, to show up for other people the way that others have shown up for me, in the good ways. Now, if you've read the book, you know that I don't always do that, right? I don't always <laughs> accomplish that. But just know that back, you know, somewhere in there, that is the goal. You know, is to show up the way that people have shown up for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk mm -hmm. about safe space. Talk about safe space? Safe spaces and spaces where, and, and the difference, the necessary moments of safe space. Um, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of chaos in the world around us all the time now, right? Um, and there are so many influences that, that threaten our peace and that threaten our center. Um, it's a schismatic time, right? And, and there's a pandemic and all these different things. And particularly when you're talking about anything where you're a minority group, whether you're talking about um, your, your gender, um, your sexual orientation, your ethnicity, um, there is something to be said for safe spaces, the importance of safe spaces and how you can find those. And let's talk about the difference. Number one, would you agree that having those safe spaces um, is very good for your mental health and, cap and capacity to really be fully you in unsafe spaces? Number one. And number two, um, in creating um, those kinds of spaces for yourself, um, how, because I, I saw you in the book trying to manifest this in certain ways and in other ways, there was so much unsafe space that it felt like for me as the reader that you were trying to create some safe spaces that weren't as safe as they seemed to, to be at first. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, of different people that you met who didn't tell you all that they were, et cetera. Um, and the influences that that was on your life. Um, mm -hmm. So would you speak a little bit about all that? Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that I believe safe space is a real thing, right? As I facilitate conversations with uh, mm -hmm. groups these days, I'm, um, mm -hmm. Oh. See, I mentioned Betty Gill earlier. That's her, like, that was not on mute right there. So, uh, but I, uh, I, I tell groups, you know, we can't guarantee safety, you know, in these conversations, you know, particularly, uh, usually because we're usually talking about. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. We're usually talking about conflict and how to how to you know move out of you know one situation into another situation. There are uh, power dynamics that are present in the relationships or in the space, um, and so I I don't know that I always believe in safe space in in public, um, but I believe you know in this concept that I read about just a couple years ago about brave space, creating brave space, space where where people can speak their truth, you know, and be heard um, and, um, and, and find a way of, of moving in, into that. I do know that for me, had I not found safety, uh, compassion, love, grace, and mercy in my mom, first of all, um, and then also in the communities that I attempted to create, that I wouldn't be here. Right. I mean, so th there had to be this sense of safety, but even to create community, living life as I did and in the way that I understood I had to in order to stay alive, I had to be brave enough to risk naming my reality to some people in hopes that it landed in the right space and in the right way so that I could be invited in and I could then in turn invite them in. So I, I think that is, is very necessary. So for any, any parent that may be struggling, I don't know how I feel about homosexuality or I don't know how I feel. Who cares how you feel? The question here is, are you willing to support this child? Are you willing to be present for them and let them figure out life knowing that you are, and nobody's asking you to agree, but will you just not hate me? Will you not put unnecessary burden upon me? Will you just get out of the way and trust that what you have poured into me will come out of me in the best of ways possible if I know you are in my corner? I don't need you to agree with me. I need you to love me and allow me to be me. And that takes bravery. That's not about safety. That's about mm -hmm. bravery on the part of the child, as well as on the part of the parent or upon the part of the church or the government or the employer, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That'll I totally forgot the second question. <laughs> 
I'm sorry, just go with that one because I, that will preach. Um, and, and insofar as it takes uh, bravery, like truly you are brave to come out in the ways that you did in this book to humanize yourself when you had such a superhuman reputation in so many ways amongst so many people. To humanize yourself in this way was incredibly brave. And by your bravery, it allows other people to see that people are complicated and that people have many different sides. Um, and we all have things that we don't announce <laughs> on the front page of the news or, you know, write books about, you know, there's, there are all kinds of things that people don't share. Yeah. Um, what are the theological underpinnings, the scriptures and um, the, the reasons theologically that you do what you do in uh, in the work that you continue to do in ministry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, my life verse, the verse that I quote every morning throughout the day and, you know, and as I close my eyes at night when I'm still conscious when they close, uh, just before they close, uh, is Colossians 3.23, uh, which I loosely translate. And by loosely translate, it means if you go trying to look for these exact words in any translation that has been codified by anyone, you will not find them. So it is my understanding of the text um, of Colossians 3.23. And that's whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and no one else. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if working for the Lord and no one else. Like that drives me. I mean, it helps me to remember who I am. It, rem it helps me to remember whose I am. It helps me to stay focused on why I'm doing what I'm doing. It helps to remind me of why I am in the world. No matter how minute the task, no matter how great the challenge, my role, my purpose is to, to work at it as if working for the Lord and no one else. Like that has guided me in ministry uh, from day one and continues to do so. Mm -hmm. That explains why you have so many different irons in the fire <laughs> in any given time because <laughs> you work so hard knowing that you are working for the Lord and, and no one else. Um, but it's also freeing what you're saying there um, in terms of that also enables you to work without fear of whoever the other people are as well. We would hope, right. We, we would hope on our, on our best days, um, you know, but just, just being clear, you know, within, within myself, I, I don't always articulate it well. Um, and I think sometimes too, and um, to step back just a little bit, I think in reflect in the the um, reflection that went into writing this book, I was able to see that some of the things that I did, though I may have done them well and may have received great accolades for them, I don't know that I did them for the right reasons. Mm. You know, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, sometimes you know it 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 could have been my my this little disease I have, this disease to please, right? It could be, you know, um, I thrive off of affirmation. So let me do this so that I can be affirmed and, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and those are not necessarily bad, but I don't know that they are right, right? And um, one of the uh, chapters, one of the seven chapters in the book is, um, uh, do the right things, right? It's not about being right, but it's about doing the right things, but doing the right things for the right reasons uh, is the lesson that that's really underneath that. And so in this um, CB 2.0, if you will, or 6.9 or 7.8 or wherever I am right now uh, in the, in the um, um, uh, gentrific re gentrification um, you know, process, I, I'm i more selective about where I show up, more selective about where I lend my voice, more selective about projects I take on, um, because I, I want to be clear that I'm doing the right things for the right reasons so that I can truly, truly 
work at it with all my heart as if working for the Lord and no one else. And really centering in this phase of life on the, the last phrase of that and for no one else, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wisdom in what you're saying, because so many of us um, in ministry, you know, if you, if you preach or you teach, uh, it feels good when people mm -hmm. affirm you. Um, when people are appreciative and that's true, not just for preachers. That's, that's true in general. If you have a job that, um, gives you any kind of positive feedback, you're teaching or nursing or any of these kinds of things. Um, it, it's, it feels good to be appreciated. And so here we are in this moment where we have to confront ourselves mm -hmm. If we're really going to be humble before God, we have to confront ourselves and our own egos. Mm -hmm. And we have to be able to let go of the things that are um, hindering us by our need for affirmation. Um, and so I really appreciate what you're saying there in terms of how we can grow in humility and in grace um, and in goodness. <laughs> And so if we are able to do this um, well, then I think we can also help other people be free to do it. Um, and I'm mindful um, that that makes me even more grateful that you took time to be here with me and with us today. Um, thank you again yeah. so much yeah. for that. Um, I wonder if there are a, a kind of a top two or three stories from the book that you think would be most helpful for others to know um, in order to, to help people who may feel alone in their struggles um, with either these things or things that are difficult to share in general. But if you want to speak specifically uh, to any particular struggle that you want to highlight from the book or from your life. Ooh. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah, I think there are three kind of um, three stories that that I believe um, are woven understandings from them, lessons from them, or are sort of woven throughout the the, the narrative. One would be um, around Boy State um, in my junior year in high school and uh, being all excited um, because someone said, hey, this would be perfect for you. And so I was like, cool, then let me make this happen, right? And to then, you know, end up in a place where I had to, in a sense, fight uh, to get what, what I believed was, was mine. Now, was I right about that? Yeah, I was. Um, and so, but this this sense that I needed to speak up for myself, I needed to uh, advocate for myself, uh, is a lesson that I learned very early on, and I think that has um, also fed this sense of uh, uber independence that can sometimes be a problem in some spaces. Um, but um, but this sense that no one's going to come save me you know, was, was ingrained kind of early, right? And so I figured out how to fight the system and, you know, and, and, and got that to, uh, to sort of bend to, to my will or to my liking. And I think that shows up uh, in other places, like um, in my senior year in college when I was graduating and I wanted to do my thesis on uh, Black theology and was told that that would be divisive uh, mm. after living through a situation where I was referred to as a black shirt, like the heck, like what in the world, right? So, so now we've moved to a space where who I am is a problem, right? So at first it was what I wanted that was a problem. Now it's who I am that's a problem. And, and I have to find a way to give voice to the absurdity of the, the system and the powers that be. And I found a way to do that. Mm -hmm. Yet when it comes to um, one half of the gene pool that was donated for me to be here, um, you know, all the self-advocacy and prodding and begging and longing in the world still to this day has not changed that situation. Mm -hmm. And so taking those three um, sort of stories or those 
threads and then bringing them back together, I would hope that people, anyone who reads this book or anyone who, uh, even if you don't read the book, step back and look at your own life and really take inventory of those places where you have excelled, those places where you did the best you absolutely could, and regardless of what the outcome was, celebrate the fact that you had the wherewithal to do it. And know that as other challenges come, you can face those and overcome those as well. And overcoming them doesn't always mean that the win looks the way we thought it would look. The win may be that we lived to see another day. We live to testify of what we were able to do, willing to do, and, and are still here to tell the story. And so um, that, that that's a... a, a, a big thing that I I would really want people to walk away from, from this conversation, from reading the book. Uh, But again, even if they're not in this conversation, if they don't read the book, uh, but just from stepping back and taking inventory of one's own life, because I think that's what helps each of us to continue to have hope. Because Mm -hmm. as long as there's hope, there's an opportunity. You get a do-over as long as you have hope, right? (laughs) So when we lose hope, we lose life. Mm. and lose life there are no no future opportunities so for me it's about you know finding the hope that is spawned by the chances that we've taken by the bravery we have been able to able to exhibit regardless of what the outcome may have been well there's a a couple of questions that are coming in um from raymond um what is a black shirt And then did you attend a seminary or Christian college as an undergrad? Yeah, great. Great question, Raymond. Thank you for that. Yes, I did attend Sanford University uh, in the great uh, suburbs of Birmingham, Alabama. When I uh, first um, entered Sanford as uh, in the fall of 94, it was aligned with the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, But by the end of my second semester, it was not. However, we had this um, program that was called H-Day, which was reminiscent of when the school was Howard College and all kinds of other stuff that um, we can talk about some other time and some other venue. But anyway, we had this program for all the ministerial students uh, who were on ministerial scholarships. You had to participate in H day, a certain number of uh, Sundays throughout the year. And what that meant was you went out into local churches and you preached and they, you would say something about the school, you would preach. Uh, they would take you, the pastor and the pastor's family would take you to lunch um, at their homes if you were not black, um, or at a restaurant, if you were, you know, on the best of days, right? And um, so in the book, I, I share the story of one of those H-Day experiences where, um, you know, those of us who were not white uh, were, um, everybody was being counted, and the person who was leading this um, H-Day experience that, that day, who happened to be a pastor of a church, uh, who was doing this, counted off and named that, you know, he had three black shirts. And I'm trying to figure out who's he talking about, because nobody here is wearing a black shirt. And uh, very quickly, I looked around and realized there were three of us who were black. And, um, and so that's how we were referred to. And upon reflecting on that, realized that that was not the first time I had heard it. It was the first time I was conscious enough to pay attention to what was, to what was happening. Mm-hmm. And yes, that was done within a Christian context. Thanks for the question, Raymond. Yeah, so both of us growing up in Alabama saw quite a lot of these kind of things that were very normative in that culture. And Mm -hmm. um, both of us um, chose a different path in terms of where where we ended up. Um, And that's not... uh, a condemnation of the entire state or anything like that, but certainly if you're working towards multiculturalism, um, there are friendlier places um, to to be that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, both of us had our time at Claremont School of Theology. Shout out to Claremont. 
um, and to the, our friends online who are from there. Um, how would you say, um, since we have that shared experience, uh, I wonder if you'll speak a moment to how it felt, um, what, what kind of a difference, because I, I know for me there was quite a bit of difference moving from Alabama to Southern California. Um, what for you were the top two or three things um, that were illumined in your experience um, that's, that are different um, between what is the experience of a black gay man in Alabama uh, versus what is the experience of a black gay man in Southern California? Ooh, honestly, I don't know that they're all that different uh, given the fact that here in California, I am, I serve within a religious context. Um, now granted, you know, where, where I live and where I serve, you know, tends to be more progressive and open and affirming and all those things. Yet we still serve within a denomination within the United Methodist context where, um, I'm, I'm skating on thin ice, you know, by writing this book, I'm skating on very thin ice by having this conversation. I'm skating on thin ice by being who I am, uh, as authentically as I possibly can be. But at least here, I can put the skates on mm. and I can get on the ice, right? In Alabama, there are no skates for little boys like me. <laughs> there, are, there are no <laughs> places uh, to really explore one's identity uh, openly and fully uh, within that context from which, uh, from which we come uh, without paying a great price for it. Um, and I would say other things that stood out to me when I when I moved to California. Uh, one, and I talk about this in the book, when I um, was leaving Birmingham and moving to California, I was completing an internship at Sixth Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham, and uh, the pastor uh, Thomas Porter, um, and it, he was sharing his introduction. He, you know, named that I was moving. California to attend Claremont. And he says, you know, we always pay attention to what's happening in California because we know it won't be long before it'll be happening here. So we'll be watching you, right? Something along those lines uh, is what he shared. And so I came to California with that in my mind of like, I need to pay attention to what's happening here so that I can send word back, you know, for people to get ready to be prepared and quickly realize People ain't concerned about that. That's not how people live, <laughs> live their lives. You know, they, they're in a system that works for them. And, you know, there's a theology, a politic, uh, a family construct, uh, an economy, um, you know, that's already, you know, well ingrained and, you know, hell is well on its way to being frozen over. And uh, none of that's, you know, shifted a whole heck of a lot uh, from what I can tell. But um, so being in California, there were a few things, though, that I did miss. Um, I missed four seasons. I missed, you know, seeing the changing colors of the leaves and fall and knowing that that's what was happening and the return of the uh, various hues of green uh, in the spring. So these browns and grays and tans that we call colors here in California took me a while to get used to. I also um, was troubled by the number of gates and bars uh, that exist on people's homes and in um, you know, particular communities. I was also struck by the, after being here for a few years, I was struck by the fact that LA is probably more segregated mm -hmm. uh, than the place of my birth. Mm -hmm. um, and because, Every community is segregated right. by language, by culture, by something right here in a way that I didn't grow up living and, and understanding uh, the, the, that being the way of the world, right? Now, we knew there were certain places you just didn't go, you know, and um, you know, we, we, we knew which counties you know, to drive around or never to, never to go through and, in, in, uh, you know, and in, in families, you know, particular families that you, that you de just didn't mess with. But I appreciated that more so than being in, in being faced with systems that are racist and discriminatory in a number of ways, but won't own it or name it. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So you just keep bumping up against something and you don't really know what it is. You know, it's like, hmm. And then you step back and reflect and examine. And it's like, oh, I do know what this is. Right. And so so I don't want to, you know, leave this conversation, you know, with anybody believing that I believe I landed in some utopia. I do believe I landed in a space at a particular time, you know, and on the shoulders of some folks who've done a lot of hard work, who've sacrificed a whole heck of a lot. Um, I mean, sure, I'm getting a little little glory, a little celebration in this moment for writing this book. But there are, you know, clergy and laity. You know, there are folk who've been in the trenches for decades, who've given their lives. That's made it possible for me to even consider sharing the story. So I want to make sure that's in this conversation too. And, um, and I don't, so I don't think I'm beginning something here. I, I see it as a continuation of something um, to help all of us move forward. Mm-hmm. These were, I, I had similar reflections um, mm. in terms of uh, when I got to California, my first thought was, oh, wow, look at all these different people. And we're having these great conversations of intercultural and interfaith conversations. And, and Claremont was good at, at creating spaces for that. Mm-hmm. But as you, as you go around, you start to recognize how incredibly segregated streets <laughs> and neighborhoods and even homes such churches, as, uh, churches um, are all just uh, things that I had not even uh, thought of they hide it it was very it's a insidious kind of racism but they knew better than actually say it out loud <laughs> right so but actually became more dangerous in some ways or at least as dangerous in some ways as the blatant racism uh, of the South, you know, so in the South, you know, we have similar food, similar religion, similar football teams, all these kinds of things, um, a, 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 a share, a lot of shared culture. Mm-hmm. In LA, not so much, you know, you, you could live on a street 20 years and maybe you would or wouldn't know your neighbor. Um, and that wasn't true. And Alabama, uh, at least not in rural Alabama. Um, yeah. And and I think it's a great. I think it's. Uh, I think it's a great. Um, I think the diversity is is an opportunity. I really see it as an opportunity, and I think it's as great an opportunity as sort of the black white divide, right? That that we grew up with, and <clears throat> and I and I think unless or until we see it as an opportunity. I, I think we'll continue to just stay stuck. We'll stay in our in our ghettos. We'll stay behind our gates. We'll continue to hide who we are and never truly get to know ourselves. Because I don't think I can truly know myself without knowing you, mm-hmm. right? I, I really don't. Right. Really don't. But there's a good question because it's just now after you publish this expose that I really feel like I know all these pieces of you that I didn't know before. I've known you for 20 years. Mm -hmm. You held quite a lot close to the vest. We've had, I don't know how many conversations, (laughs) a lot. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, and yet, you know, um, the choice um, to be uh, vulnerable you know, the choice to be in the midst uh, of being real, even when it's dangerous or risky or scary or potentially hurtful, you know, Mm -hmm. people, are they going to judge me? Are they going to hurt me? Are they going to reject me? Right. Um, And yet, if we don't give people the opportunity, um, then we never get to the potential of building the beloved community in the world. Yeah, yeah, and there's a certain privilege to this too. Um, that that I that I I think it would be disingenuous not to not to name, right? I mean, I do have the privilege of of um, of the various spaces that I get to occupy, you know, in places where I have voice that a lot of people don't. 
Yeah. Right. They don't have it. And that that's a privilege. And I think with that privilege comes great responsibility. Right. And so I have a responsibility to open that space up for other voices, open that space up for others to, you know, to explore, you know, to consider what it might be for them to step into a braver way of being. Uh, whether that's on the um, the giving or the receiving, you know, of uh, one story. And so, uh, so I want to name that into this space too. And because sometimes people will ask, well, you know, how, how can I, how can I support you? How can I help you? Well, the, the number one thing that all of us can do is to step back, examine, own, and claim the privilege that we have. And don't deny it, claim it, own it, and then use it to open up space for others to step into similar or those same spaces. Mm. Because all of us, I mean, if we wanna play oppression Olympics, I will win. I, I have proof, I will win, right? If we wanna do the oppression Olympics, I got you. I got you, hands down. But even with that, even with all the states of oppression that I can name, that I exist within, I can also name state and status and privilege that I occupy and possess. And what good is it if I don't use it for good, again, to do the right things for the right reasons? And thank you for that, because it's, a, it's sort of a slickery slope. <laughs> Hmm. when you have been oppressed and you're not doing things for the right reason and then become an oppressor that that's a i mean we see that in politics we see that we see that in the church we see, we see it in a, a lot of different places so mm -hmm. we come back to the humility of it's not about you but it's about something that's bigger than you. And so I appreciate that you're continuing to pull that back. Um, Michael Mitchell has a question. Um, uh -oh. And then Gay, Gay, has, Gay Fisher has a follow-up um, <laughs> on the side here. Um, what do we do about this fake authenticity about inclusion in our churches? Lots of talk, but no real effort towards inclusion. And then Gay says, good question, Michael, but how do we get folks to open up and tell their stories? Mm. Well, um, good question, Michael and Gay. Thank you for uh, the question and the, and the follow-up. One, I think we need to be clear what we mean by inclusion. Just like we need to be clear, you know, when we celebrate our diversity you know, of community, of church, of whatever it is, right? I think we need to be clear about what we mean uh, by inclusion. And because oftentimes what we mean by inclusion is tokenism. You know, we want some black people involved or we want some people of color involved, but when we get too many involved, then this is all different. And, you know, and then if we bring up the race issue or we bring up language or culture, somehow that's viewed as divisive. It's like, no, it's just real, you know, so let's just, let's just deal with it, right? So, so I think being clear what we mean by inclusion, but then also, once we're clear about what we mean by inclusion, we need to be ready for the transformation that is necessary for inclusion to happen, because we can't have inclusion and stay the same. Inclusion, by its very nature, as I understand it, is an acceptance and inviting in a reception of, of all that comes, you know, with a person or with a community that's being included. Um, and that by its very nature is going to transform an institution or an organization, a program, a policy, whatever it is you're trying to do, it is going to transform form it. So if you're not open to transformation, you can't be open to inclusion. So we got to be clear what we mean by conclusion, inclusion, and be prepared for transformation. Um, and what was Gay's follow-on question? Follow-up was, uh, how do we get folks to open up and tell their stories? Mm, 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 mm. I think we need a few brave souls. Um, so right here today, I'm starting a brave campaign, you know, so just 
hashtag it everywhere, the brave campaign, right? So we, we need a few brave souls to, to step out and, 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 and to just tell a teeny portion of your story and ask people, like, don't be nosy, but ask curious questions of folks and, um, you know, offer, offer, and then ask, right? And, um, and I think we can do that one-to-one, two-by-two, four-by-four. There's something biblical about that too, uh, that, that we could lean on. But I think, you know, having a few brave souls, you know, uh, step out and share pieces and parts of their stories that are not just known um, and not full, maybe, maybe known, but not fully understood to do that in an open and authentic way uh, without being defensive and without being, you know, elusive, as I was trying to be in some of the earlier drafts of, of, this, uh, of this book. Um, but I, I, I think that begins to open up the space, you know, uh, but somebody has to go first, right? Mm. Somebody has to be brave enough to, uh, to step out there. This brought up a, a, a experience I had a couple of years ago. My mom calls me, called me, this is not in the book, um, and this is probably more her story than mine, but I don't think she's on here, so I'm okay to share it. But my mom, you know, called me and she said, you know, I have, you know, the Lord gave me this idea for a book. And I said, oh, really? You know, what, what, you know, tell me about it. She says, well, you know, she said, I, it's just been put on my heart to write this book about coming out. Mm. I'm like, I'm on the phone. I'm like, uh, mom, <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's like, no, not me. You know, she's like, it's these parents, you know, whose kids have embraced who they are. They moved on, they're living their lives, but these parents are still stuck in the closet trying to, you know, hold on to what will never be and trying to put up a facade like everything is okay or that, you know, they're waiting for their child to be the way that they want them to be as opposed to embracing who they fully are. And these parents need to come out. She's like, and I want to write that book and I want to tell that story. And I think that's brave, right? I think that's brave activity for, for my mom to say, you know what, you know, I was probably one of those who was in the closet, but clearly you are not. So let me, you know, let me, you know, share with the world, you know, what it is to, to live on the other side of this and to really be free and have a deep, meaningful and love-centered relationship because we're able to be authentic uh, in, in a particular space. So I, I think that helps to, to create uh, the inclusion that we need and uh, opens up those spaces for bravery to, uh, to come to the center. Mm. So join the brave campaign. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gary Barbary had a comment that I, I, it was a question. Um, do you contemplate a volume two, maybe advice, support for coming generations, something like California uncle? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. If uh, and I, I love that question and the fact that it comes from Gary makes it even more special. Um, and give my love to Lynn as well, uh, Gary. And if I had had time, I would I would run over and grab a shirt out of my closet. A couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege of preaching at uh, Hollywood UMC, and the theme for that Sunday uh, centered around the movie Uncle Frank. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime, so you can watch it there. And um, uh, my beloved gave me this T-shirt, this Gunkle, you know. And uh, so, so maybe the next volume will be Gunkle, right? Um, because um, I hope that if nothing else, uh, whatever the world does with this story, you know, is is the world's business. But I hope my nieces and my nephews, uh, both those by blood and those by adoption. Uh, will see my life and and know that all things are indeed possible, that they'll see, you know, uh, an example of someone who didn't always get it right and didn't always know exactly what to do, but kept trying, right? Kept trying to do the right thing for the right reason and hopes he's pointing uh, in the right direction. I see that Susan Schenken is on. Uh, Susan is the publisher of this book, so shout out to uh, Susan. 
And uh, Susan will tell you that uh, what ended up as the book is about half of the material that was written. Uh, so there could be a volume two, uh, but it, it, it may actually yeah. you know, just, just, you know, become like blog posts, uh, you know, opportunities for uh, dialogue, uh, which you can join by going to my website, cedricbridgeport.com <laughs> or alabamagrandson.com and, um, and can join our, our mailing list and, and keep up with, with what's happening there. Hi, Susan. Hi, Cedric. So <laughs> nice to see you in your element. This is, has been wonderful. I just feel like you've been so open and so sharing and I, I really really am touched by your story from the beginning and I just have such deep love for you and um, so proud of you just you know I really see you and I'm so proud of you and so proud to have been part of it thank you Susan thank you yeah, thank you Susan everybody give a shout out to Susan yay Glad Without... you came. Yes. yeah <laughs> I wouldn't have missed it for the world awesome yeah so, all right um yeah so Gary had a follow-up comment over here that um, you once brought your niece to a charge conference at St. James and she made a wondrous impression upon the folks there. Um, and also a statement about bravery that being brave is not celebrated. Hmm. Um, and then somebody tried that at general conference for those of you that aren't Methodist, the general conference is the, the large global gathering of the Methodist. Uh, general conference 2016, they walked away and wouldn't talk anymore. There's always a risk. Mm -hmm. Being brave always carries a risk. Um, but, um, and truly, uh, one of the things I've been thinking about before this conversation, and I'm back to it now, um, there, there is a, something to be learned. Um, from each of our journeys and all the complications of that journey, all the different things that happen yeah. and the way that we respond to it. Um, I, I heard a recent message um, from another member of the Commons. Uh, well, actually, it was it was from Jihad Turk. You know, Jihad mm -hmm. Turk. Yeah, yeah. He was yeah. here visiting Omaha. Oh. <laughs> and so <laughs> I know. People go to Omaha other than you, Anna? Okay, great. I love it. I don't I love understand. It. It's just like I'd never been here. And then all of a sudden, people are just coming. No, you're drawing people to, to Omaha. Something. Sure. Um, so anyway, so here he was. And, and he was giving a message at Friday Prayers, and I went, um, the American Muslim Institute, and he was talking about that the real question when bad things happen to us is not to ask why, but to ask how, and specifically, how do we respond to these things that happen to us with beauty and love? Hmm. And what I took from that was... Um, the why is a disempowering space. The why is a victimization space. Like, why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. I say, how can I respond to this with beauty and love and intention? This is an empowering co-creation space, right? Um, and so what I feel like you've done in this book is to really, by just telling the story, give one example of how you can respond to the mountaintops or the valleys of your life with a message of hope, of beauty, of love, of intention. And I've heard it from you several times during this conversation. Um, but how is it that you would like this book, this the story or even this conversation to impact the way others might interact with their own difficult journeys. Mm -hmm. um, are there are there other things that you can think of about how to interact to bring forth beauty and hope um, when these things happen? Mm -hmm. Pointers mm -hmm. from a from a wizened one. <laughs> Well, we'll have to pin somebody else on the screen for that, but I'll give it a go <laughs> for the wiser one. I'll give, but I'll give it a go. Um, I think if, if you if you have the book, if you open up to the table of contents 
and you look at the chapter titles, those are lessons, right? Those are mantras, they are lessons. Um, and I think any one of them uh, can, can um, and you can interpret it however you want. Like the first one, trust your gut, right? There's, there's this inner knowing, there's this inward knowing that, that we have, that we sometimes dampen, that we dismiss. And sometimes it's because of what's happened to us, you know, or we're, we're too uh, closed off or we've been wounded so deeply, or it's just not time, you know, for us to really trust ourselves. But, but if we can find a way to get in touch with that inner voice, that inner, that in, inner knowing, and, and really listen to it and get in tuned with it and follow it, Again, it may not turn out the way you envisioned it, mm. but are you on the other side of it, mm. right? And as long as you're aware, right, <laughs> in the midst of it or aware on the other side, then you have not given up or you have not lost hope. And as long as you have not lost hope, there's another opportunity ahead. And if you look at number two, it's do the right things, which I've said multiple times in here, but it's do the right things for the right reasons. That's not try to be right. You know, sometimes you are right, but you're doing the wrong things, you know, and sometimes you are right. And it's wrong for you to say, I'm right, you know, but I'm right. Well, that's such a small thing to be right. Mm -hmm. Are you righteous? And are you doing the right things for the right reason? And you can continue to, I mean, all the way down, those, those seven chapters, um, uh, manage your losses, which we talk about in the book in a variety of ways, right? There will be losses. This life is not all about gains, right? There are losses, but in the midst of those losses, how are you managing yourself? What learning are you taking away from those, those failed opportunities, those missed opportunities? How are you uh, shaping that narrative? Not to make yourself the victim so that everybody can do the, ooh, woe is you, but how are you shaping the narrative to say, these are the lessons I can learn from what I just went through or what I went through 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Listen well. We have to get back to listening. So much speaking, so much that everybody feels they have to say. I mean, every social media platform just blasting and blaring at us three, uh, uh, 24 seven, we turn on the TV, people are just talking, no one's listening. We have to not just listen, but listen well. Uh, the first one, you know, is about trusting your gut. The fourth one is about uh, engaging other people and really listening to people's heart listening to, to, to what's underneath, listening between the lines. Uh, you know, the best music are those that have those pauses, those spaces, right? That, that space in between the notes, that's where the magic really happens, learning to let go. Some stuff we, we, we pride ourselves on holding on to our unforgiveness, our, you know, lack of ability to love anymore or to extend grace or mercy. We, we revel in that. I like being mad. I mean, we've all met people. We've sometimes been the, I would just want to be mad, right? But we have to learn to let go of some stuff. And the hard thing for me was to learn to let go of some people. There are some people that you need to learn to let go. And if somebody says they want to go, let them. Now that right there is for free. Build a team. And what I mean by that, that's number six, is build a team. And that right. team, is, it's family, it's community, it's, it's whatever you want to call it. But don't try to do this alone. Don't try to make life on your own, but build a team, build community, be a part of community where you can be brave, where you can practice your bravery in-house before you go out-house. Uh, with it, because if you don't have a space where where you can do that inwardly and with people that that you love and and they love you and trust you and will support you and and build you up, then you'll never be able to go out into the world and do it. And the last one, chapter seven, is about working it out. Just just work it out, figure it out, work it out. You know. So that's what I would say. Like whatever situation we find ourselves in. Pick one of these, you know, make it a mantra for the day, you know, meditate on it and journal about it. Um, make a T-shirt and give me 20 percent 
you know, or whatever it is you need to do, you know, to, <laughs> you know, to be able uh, to, to move forward. Because in the end, we need you. We need your authentic and best self present as much as possible in the world. So do what you have to do to maintain hope and move forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to step back into one of the things you just said, because I think it's such a core concept for all of us. And it's something that I, I'm kind of passionate about. And that is what you said about listening. For me, listening is loving. If you listen to somebody, because no, but most people haven't been taught how to listen mm -hmm. along the course of their lives. And the culture does not reward listening. Culture re rewards people who can speak well, not necessarily people who can listen well. People who can listen well have other things that are rewards for them meaningful relationships with people, um, uh, a, a wisdom about them because they've been listening to the world around them. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of um, wins that are spiritual wins, but not necessarily the day-to-day <laughs> the -day wins. And, uh, but in order to listen, we have to create a space for the other to just be them. Listening does not require a response. Listening only requires being present, being loving, being real, paying attention. And in today's world in particular, what you're talking about social media and, and other things, when we, when we see all this stuff coming at us and coming at us with such a fury, um, and it's, it's targeted at us. It's literally targeted to keep us watching, to keep us triggered, mm -hmm. to keep us angry or scared or anything. Separated. Else. Separated. And we have, especially now in the COVID season, we have lost our ability to have meaningful um, dialogue with people. Like we, we're just, sep we're physically separated and then we get separated in all these other ways. And so the loneliness that might've already been there because people weren't listening to us um, make, is made even worse by this, this sort of imposed <laughs> distancing. And it's even harder when we have to start listening to ourselves mm -hmm. or not. And so many people during the COVID season had a difficult time with the introspection that was forced on them by that whole, that whole moment mm -hmm. of now you're sitting in your house and mm -hmm. now you have to deal with yourself because you can't go and run and do all your busyness to get away from the things that are troubling you. And yeah. so yeah. many people like changed their jobs and careers and all these different things because wrote they were books. forced to live with themselves, right? They wrote books, they did all these things. Um, and, and yet I think it's, I think it's a beautiful gift that you bring listening into your wisdom discussion, because if we really did take the time, make the time to listen to one another, not to respond, but to just hold space. And we made that an intentionality. I think we would be in a very different situation in our churches, in our communities, and in the world. And it's a gift that we can give to people. But in order to do it, we do have to surrender, as you said, the affirmation uh, mentality of like, I say something smart. So then you, <laughs> so then you say, I'm very smart. <laughs> so, um, but if you can let go of that for a minute and just, just be okay, just, just being there, just being you. And the beauty of what you've done with this book is it says to me in this moment in time, Cedric is okay with Cedric. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the beginning of being able to do this transformative healing work in the world, because until you're okay with you, can't really be okay with other people. 
Right. That's, that's exactly right. And for me, you know, getting to this place a few years ago, um, you know, where it's like, wait a minute, like, what am I doing? Right. I mean, so, so we could, you know, we could talk peripherally, you know, about 2016 and all that, um, you know, which was a horrible, <laughs> dark, <laughs> dark night of the soul kind of, um, you know, whole little season. Um, but I'm not bitter because of it. I'm better because of it, right? I am better because of it, because it forced me to reckon with myself. It forced me to take inventory of, of my own life, of my own intellect, of my own will. But most of all, it caused me to step back and to reflect upon my call. Mm. Like, who am I called to be in and for the world? Mm-hmm. Not not for the church, mm-hmm. but for the world. And I think for too long, my vision of my call was limited to and by the church. Mm. I don't exist for the church. Mm-hmm. The church is a vehicle. That's right. To serve the world. That's right. And once that clicked, mm-hmm. like I got it. I got it. You know, and three, four years later now, I, I can tell you that story, right? I can tell you that. I couldn't have told you that then. So so people, you know, will say, well, you know, are you disappointed that you didn't, you know, continue, you know, in the, you know, Episcopal process? No, I'm not. I'm not. It's clear to me in hindsight, I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> you know, like, there, there, I wasn't ready for that. You know, did I sense a call to it? Sure. You know, I'm open to it. Sure. But was that the moment? No. 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 And I said that, I, I said that um, probably a little more eloquently than I'm saying it now, you know, on the floor of jurisdictional conference when I withdrew, you know, on, on the floor when I withdrew before the first ballot was taken was that this is just not the time, right? But even then, I wasn't sure what that meant, Mm -hmm. but now I know, now I know. So out of that dark, desperate, desolate place, God spoke, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, the devil may have brought it, but God sent it. And so I receive it, (laughs) I receive it. And, um, and I'm grateful for it, you know, because now I can, I can move forward and be me and you know what what god has for me is for me you know and i believe if if anything is of god we can't stop it anyway right Mm -hmm. but it will happen in god's time and in the way that god ordains for it to be my role is to be ready for it at the appointed time Mm -hmm. and this brings us back to the not not the why but the how Mm -hmm. because um certainly we don't grow on the mountaintop. We grow in the valleys. Yeah, that's what helps us climb the mountain. But, but the valleys are hard. They're hard and they're dark. And I don't trust <laughs> anything that grows in the dark. <laughs> I just want to say that. I just want to put that right here. The valleys are not okay. Yeah. At the same time, we're not alone. And it's in those moments where things are hard. Um, that our faith is exercised. I mean, do we? It doesn't take a lot of faith to believe in something you can see. Correct. It doesn't take any. It doesn't take any faith at all. You, the faith is subject to being hoped for and the evidence of things you don't see, right? So it takes a lot of faith when you can't see, when you, when you don't know, when there's all this, this uh, cloud around you where a lot of darkness is, a lot of unknowns. Um, and a lot of spaces where you just don't know what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But God is with us. And, and the older that I get, the more that I know, one, that I'm not going to like it when these <laughs> things happen, right? I know that I'm not going to like it. And I know that I'm going to have, have my season of the why anyway. Like I, I'm not quite elevated enough in my own spirituality to start with the how. I, I still end up, I'm not there yet. I still mm-hmm. start with the why and try to get to the how. Um, can I respond with beauty and love? 
but I do, I'm getting faster mm -hmm. about moving from the why to the how that that's the wisdom of experience that I can look back on my life and it, when I'm in a difficult time and start to name the places where I've already been through this, 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 and God mm -hmm. was there and mm -hmm. God did a thing and God gave what I needed. Even yeah. if I thought that was not the case <laughs> when I could have sworn on a stack of Bibles that God had abandoned me, but, but truly that's not the case. Right. And that's that hope, right? Yeah. That's what it would continues to, to fuel and instill and call forth that hope, right? That, that I can keep going. I can keep going because I'm not moving on my own. Look at this, your sister sending you some love. Oh boy. Your sister's over there saying, I want to say a Cedric's sister, that I love him unconditionally, and he has always been the best role model and my best friend. Oh, don't make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's so sweet. she's part of the team. She's part of the team. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that that I think we can take from all of this too is you know in those 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 dark desperate desolate moments, who is there with you? I mean that that's your team, that's your team, and um, you know when the tough times come, the tough people show up and they stay they stay with you, mm -hmm. and those are the folks who won't let you stay there either, right? right. You know, those are the ones who will love you back to reality, uh, sometimes in some very tough and intentional ways, but they will love you back to reality and help you to move on. Mm -hmm. And I can say that in reflecting back on my life and, you know, looking at just how my world is, is oriented and orchestrated uh, these days, I no longer talk about a best friend or a good friend. I have friends and I have colleagues and I have the rest of the world, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Because for me, friend doesn't need to be qualified anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm clear mm -hmm. that either you're, you're, you're for me and the quote W or you're again me, right? I mean, so it's, you know, it's like, so friend, just like love doesn't need to be qualified. Mm. It just is, or it isn't. Oh, that's lovely. <laughs> I see a lot of our friends on here. <laughs> this is this is a, a good thing. It says, um, Pat Luna says that your sister has an awesome brother, and I bet you're a wonderful sister in person, too. <laughs> she is. She is. She's a great mother, great cousin, and aunt. I mean, she's she's really become kind of the the what's that thing called in the middle of the wheel? You know, that, that thing that all the spokes connect to the, she's a connector. She's yeah. a connector. Yeah. The word is escaping me just right now. Yeah. I don't hub. Know. Hub. The hub. hub. All right. Thanks, Thanks Gilbert. <laughs> Thanks Gilbert. <laughs> Yay. Have that, a bicycle, so have a bicycle was, right there. Maybe that so. was Gilbert too. Yeah. That was Gilbert Stones. Yeah. Aww, love, Gilbert. love to Gilbert. Um, also, it says still point. <laughs> okay. All right. She's a connector. You know, she's a connector. She's a connector. Yeah, That's she's right. A connector. So um, in the last few minutes that we have here, were there, was there anybody else? Because I've been reading questions out of the chat. Were there any other questions that here at the last few moments that you all wanted to um, kind of put out there for Cedric to answer? There's been a lot of content dropped in this, <laughs> this conversation. Um, and so I, I hope that it has uh, been really um, life affirming for you and um, helpful for you. And so my, my great um, hope and sort of thing that I'm looking towards is our, uh, something that brings us all together is this connection that we share the faith that we're working on learning um, and the courage to be vulnerable, to be real mm -hmm. with the people around us. And certainly these are things that Cedric has modeled for us uh, and for which I'm 
tremendously grateful for. Um, you were a great DS, but you're an even better human um, <laughs> and brother in Christ. And I'm very, very grateful uh, that you have taken time with us today to be sharing your real story and your real self. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for for inviting me and for allowing me this space and this platform to to be in this dialogue. And I hope this conversation continues beyond uh, those of us who are gathered uh, in this Zoom space and those who may you know watch the recording or even hear about it later. I hope you know we continue you know to find those spaces to listen to each other to step into a brave relationship with one another and um, find those opportunities to share those parts of ourselves that, that may scare the living hell out of us, but do it anyway. <laughs> do, do it anyway. Because anyway. once you do it, it's done. And what are they gonna do? <laughs> yeah. So there's two, there's two things, uh, kind of announcement-y things that I want to bring into this conversation. One, for those that don't know, um, there is a tri faith event for September the 11th, um, that will be at 7.30 at Tri-Faith, um, and it will be uh, a remembrance. This is a 20-year anniversary. It's hard to believe it's been 20 years, but 20-year mm. um, anniversary of 9-11, uh, and so we will be having something in person outside uh, the Tri-Faith Center, and you're all welcome uh, to attend. I think it's also on Zoom. Um, so you can attend that way if you'd like to. And so several of us will be helping to lead that. I'm doing something, um, do from synagogue and the mosque. Um, we have laity that are also helping with it as well. It's not on zoom. Wendy says, okay. Um, so we will be doing that, um, the day after tomorrow. And I'm very excited about bringing together, uh, other folks in the community that are, Promoting intercultural and interreligious dialogue and friendship. Um, so there's that. And in a couple of weeks on September the 22nd um, at 6.30 here Central Time. So for those of you in California, it's 4.30 again. Um, I will be having a conversation with Dr. John Philip Newell, um, who used to be the rector at Iona Abbey. Um, some of y'all might know about that in Scotland. Um, he's really... a uh, a fairly well-known um, Celtic Christian creation kind of guy. Um, and so if y'all are interested in, uh, if, if you're interested in that, then you can look at the Countryside website um, or the Countryside Facebook page, or those of you that are friends with me on Facebook, I'll probably also put it on my Facebook page um, and you can sign up to, to do that. Um, and it's free. Um, we always accept donations um, for the work that we do, but um, anybody that, that wants to come from wherever you are, you're more than welcome to be part of that conversation as well and, and continue on with our journey of learning together and sharing together um, and continue to grow as uh, Christians, as people of faith, um, and as humans sharing a planet that we are seeing is going through a lot right now. So I hope y'all have a really great night and thank you so much for coming. This has been a good conversation and blessings to you, Cedric. And thank you. Love you. Um, take care. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Anna.